Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to our June live storytelling podcast week live stream from Podbean. We are so excited to be here with the folks from Queer as Fact podcast, just an incredible podcast. And thank you so much for being here with us today. We've got Jace and Alice from Queer as Fact, and it's an incredible podcast. We're going to deep dive into it. And first, I'm going to read our intro, and then we'll jump in and get started. So welcome back, everyone, to Podbean Storytelling Podcast Week and Podcasting Smarter Live Series. This is our live event for June, Pride Through History, a live conversation with the creators of the Queer as Fact podcast, featuring Alice and Jace of the Queer as Fact podcast. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Storytelling Podcast Week has live stream sessions like this one with top podcasters and storytellers from scripted fiction and nonfiction podcasts from across our world and our imaginations. We also have exclusive recorded episodes on the Podcasting Smarter podcast. Storytelling Podcast Week is brought to you by Podbean. We're a podcast hosting and monetizing platform and home to over 640,000 podcasts. To start your podcast, head over to podbean.com today. And now we'll jump in. Hi, guys. How's it going? Good. Thank you very much for having us. We're very Absolutely. excited. Absolutely. We're so excited to chat with you. And first off, for everybody out there who loves the show, but or maybe people who haven't heard of it, tell us a little bit about Queer as Fact and how the idea for the show came about. I guess I'll handle that one because we brought Jace on board a bit later on. Yeah. So Queer as Fact has two components. One is our kind of main podcast, Queer as Fact, which is a queer history podcast. What we say is that we talk about queer history around the world and throughout time. So we cover topics from anywhere and any time. We've talked about the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest stories in the world, thousands of years old. And we've talked about things as recent as stuff that's happened in the 2000s. Um, and then we also have episodes which are part of our Queer as Fiction series where we talk about queer history and media and how those things kind of come together. So both films or TV shows or books about queer history and also films or TV shows or books or whatever it may be from key moments in queer history. Um, we started this about five years ago, I think, 2017. I guess that's, that's actually six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we started this six years ago, and at the time <laughs> we started it, there was just really nobody doing queer history podcasting. So now we're very lucky to have quite a few other queer history podcasts looking at queer history from different angles. So you might have heard of Bad Gays, who specifically looks at how we talk about problematic queer figures. There's um one from The Vault, I think it's called, which is a trans history podcast. There's quite a few different ones now. But back then, there wasn't anyone doing this. And so there was this real gap we saw in kind of taking queer history and taking some of the more academic research and that kind of stuff and making it really accessible and engaging for the general public so they could realise the breadth of stuff that was out there. So uh, we just kind of began with that idea that we wanted to make queer history more accessible and make it really sort of fun and engaging and something that people could really easily get into. And from there, we created the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really a collaborative podcast, right? It's not one person in the mic. There's four of you guys. So tell us a little bit about the team and Jace, how you got involved. And I think everybody out there also wants to know how Queer as Fiction came about as well. Because, you know, I think that the the narrative journey that you take people on, it's so engaging. And I think centering queer history is incredibly important. So tell us a little bit about uh, the team and Queer as Fiction as well. Yeah, um, so there's there's four of us and we all knew each other well before um, we started the podcast. Uh, I was in fact already living with Eli um, when the podcast started, which is kind of an explanation for how we ended up with Queer as Fiction episodes, um, which is basically just that Eli and I would be constantly talking about the fact that there was podcast recording equipment in the house and we had a lot of things that we wanted to talk about. 
And in particular, because unlike uh, Alice, Irene and Eli, who all have kind of a history and classics background, um, my background is in media and politics. And so I'm much more interested in kind of media analysis and communications um, and that side of things. So, yeah, we kind of thought, well, why not add a little bit more content, you know, bring a fourth person um, on board so that, you know, we can kind of spread the workload out a bit more. Um and then, uh, yeah, so it was, I think, about nine or ten months after the start of the podcast uh, when I joined in to, I think, edit a couple of episodes and maybe I maybe sat in on, as an audience member or what? Yeah, probably as a way of kind of easing you into what we did, yeah. Yeah, um, and then, yeah, it started, started doing the Curious Fiction episodes. Um, but, yeah, so I think there was a lot of just sort of being uh, for queer people who you know, hung out together a lot and would have a lot of conversations and would read interesting Wikipedia articles or read, um, you know, read little tidbits or posts on Tumblr that would sort of mention something. And it's like, is that true? Like, we can, what, what, what is going on there? Um, and then sort of going and deep diving into that and, you know, trying to bring across something with a bit more thorough, rigorous, well-researched basis to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something where, you know, a lot of the time, queer history is a footnote, right? <laughs> and mm-hmm. so taking that footnote and, you know, filling that out, fleshing out the reality of the history is is such an important aspect. And I think on the queer as, as fiction side, it's really one of those life imitates art, imitates life kind of situations as well. So, yeah, um, it's just a fantastic show. Um and can you both share some insights? You know, I think JC kind of touched on this of, you know, you guys all being friends and finding things that were of interest. Um, but can you guys talk about the process of of researching the topics and episodes for the show? Because, um, I mean, there's so much research that goes into it. Yeah, I think it really varies episode to episode because depending on what kind of queer history you're doing, you could be looking at books or we could be looking at, you know, going on YouTube and looking for interviews, looking at newspaper articles, could be anything. Um, if people want to really, you know, thorough step-by-step process, I'll be honest, I start at Wikipedia. Um, no, before that, we have, a, we have a list of suggestions that our listeners have been sending in for years and years, and there's hundreds of suggestions on that list. So I'll generally go to that list and think, what do I want to talk about? Maybe I want to focus on a particular country or a particular theme like lesbian history or trans history, two-spirit history, whatever it might be. And I'll kind of go through that list and find someone who fits into that category. And then I'll go to Wikipedia and find out, you know, what are the main books on that topic? What are the main biographies or whatever it may be that are referenced on that? And then it's just a lot of reading and note-taking, thousands and thousands of words of (laughs) note-taking and hours and hours of reading books. And then I think the that part is time consuming, but, you know, just reading stuff and writing it down. And then the really challenging part of not so much the research, but once we get into creating a podcast episode is taking what is often a huge amount of content, which is probably surprising given how much queer history has been erased, but taking a huge amount of content and information and thinking like, what parts of this are really important for our audience? What parts are going to be engaging and keep people interested? And how are we going to actually pull that all together into an hour of content, which sounds like a long time, but is a really short time when you want to cover someone's whole life or a whole kind of period and moment in history and queer experience in that moment. So a decent amount of my time researching is definitely, or not researching, but creating an episode is definitely spent just cutting down and cutting down and really trying to figure out what are the key moments that will draw people in and will tell people something really interesting about queer history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Jace? Oh, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's interesting to compare that to sort of the process I have for a lot of the queerest fiction episodes because obviously, you know, I don't have to do as much archival research and, you know, reading extensive biographies of people. It's not to say I don't have to do that at all. I've definitely done it a couple of times. Um, but, you know, particularly if we're talking about, you um, you know, something from the 50s or 60s, uh, often, you know, we have sort of interviews with the director or writer of the movie. And so it's it's reasonably simple to sort of get, you know, sort of authorial intent. 
um, which is often a real difficult thing when it comes to someone's actual life, um, especially if it was hundreds of years ago, um, sort of trying to figure out what they intended when they said certain things. But then, you know, what I find is often trying to balance uh sort of presenting a piece of media and sort of talking about that piece of media but trying to situate that within a uh, sort of historical context and trying to situate that within a media context. And so trying to find, you know, that's kind of where a lot of my historical research goes. It goes a lot broader um, of like, you know, okay, what did the movie landscape look like at this time or what did the theatre landscape look like at this time and what were contemporary pieces of media that were happening um, how were people reacting to them? That kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's a kind of I don't have to go as deep uh, into you know individual people's lives often, but I do have to kind of look at well, what what was the rest of society doing so that I can contextualize how they might have reacted mm. to this piece of media. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you both said so much, so I think Jace will start there. I mean, like, what was the cultural zeitgeist, right? Because when you're looking at the queer experience through the history of media, right? I think one of your latest episodes is on uh, like British film noir in the 60s, right? <laughs> it's something where, okay, h- how was the media portraying the queer experience in the 60s, right? What was being said? What was being shown? What wasn't? You know, I think that, that that's also a really important aspect. It's not just a piece of work, but it's about the society and the culture that was surrounding it at that time. Um, and Alice, you said so much in terms of the in terms of what goes into making an episode. So for everybody out there who listens to the podcast, loves podcasts, or who has a podcast, I think it's really important to understand Wikipedia, right? It it, it isn't verified, but it can be your friend. There's resources <laughs> there. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're all we're all guilty of that. It's definitely something where, you know, if you're if you if you Google something or you think, oh, you know, I wonder about that historical figure, I wonder about is it Dora Duncan? I wonder about the history of, you know, queer piracy, whatever it is. It's something where, um, you know, you start on Wikipedia, but they'll have references listed. And then mm-hmm. that'll take you down a rabbit hole of verified information and and things that have gone to publication. And so, you know, there's definitely ways to go about it in a, in a legitimate way through Wikipedia. So I think that that's really interesting. And, and just the way you mentioned also pulling things out, right? An hour isn't that long especially when you're discussing things and you're excited and and you know you want to you want to create that narrative thread i think it's something that you know it's important to understand and we talk about this all the time at pod being just being focused on the listener experience right and making sure that it's listener forward hey maybe this is this happened this was part of the narrative but is it pivotal will mm. it fit into the episode does it fit into the to the arc of the of the narrative that we're telling about this person or the subject? So I think that that that's a really important aspect as well, um, because you know I think maybe everybody these days is kind of is kind of guilty of going down a rabbit hole, right? <laughs> a historical yeah. rabbit hole, or a Wikipedia rabbit hole, or a media rabbit hole. I think you know whether it's um, via TikTok or social media or Wikipedia, you know, and finding, you know, one thing leads to another and kind of just going down that, following that path. And, you know, on the internet, a lot of things aren't verified, but just, you know, seeing where it leads you. I think there is so much extraneous information. It's really easy to get sidetracked. And so Mm -hmm. I think in terms of creating the episode, it, it must be sometimes a little bit of a challenge to kind of think, okay, you know, what am I leaving on the cutting room floor? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say in terms of the audience experience stuff, I mean, that's one of the things with the structure of how our podcast works is, yeah. um, you know, we will have one person who's gone away and done the research and then we'll yeah. have, uh, you know, one to two other people sitting there who haven't done the research and maybe heard of this um, person or, you know, if it's a movie, obviously I get them to watch the movie because it'd be weird <laughs> if they hadn't. Um, but what we're trying to do with that is reflect the way that a listener will hear something and maybe be like, oh, hang on, hang on, stop, expand on that more. Um, and, you know, th- that's kind of our role when we're not hosting episodes yeah. directly when we haven't done the research ourselves is to sort of be that audience surrogate and to try and, you know, represent the audience's curiosity for little tidbits that will come up in the episode that the researcher might be like, oh, okay, I've just, you know, I've got so much information in front of me that it's hard for me to see what is interesting because it's hard to see, you know, 
like you're missing the forest for the trees kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what's so great about the the group of you guys and that the listener can, you know, go along on the journey with whoever is also recording but hasn't been the main researcher of the mm-hmm. episode, right? Yeah, it's definitely yeah. something where you're along for the ride. Um, and I want to ask you both, you know, what have some of your favorite episodes been of the show to record and why? Hmm. It's interesting that you said favorite to record because I feel like favorites to like research and favorite overall Ooh, is let's different. Do both. <laughs> um, well, the one that came to mind was one that I thought that was a, a favorite to research, but favorite, maybe not favorite to record. Not that it was bad. Um, I recently did one on women's sexuality in ancient Rome. And I really enjoyed doing that because, so I studied classics at uni. I learned Latin and I learned all about ancient Rome and everything. And it was through not even that much fault of my teachers, just through the fault of the field over years and years and years, it was very male focused. And um, we'd done several episodes looking at men's sexuality in Rome. And every time I pick up a book about men's sexuality in Rome, there's like a little chapter or a little note even that kind of says, oh, and we acknowledge that there are women too. Um, we're not going to talk about them here, but women do exist. Right. And um, <laughs> in my episode I'd originally done years ago on men in Rome, I'd done the same thing. I'd said like, look, I'm not going to talk about women today, but one day I will. And so finally, a couple of years ago, someone actually published a book about women's sexuality in ancient Rome. It only took 2,000 years, but they got there. (laughs) And um, so I was just really excited to finally be able to come to that topic and give it the time it deserved and not make women's history just be a little footnote to men's history that never got properly explored. Um, Yeah, so that was a favourite of mine in terms of research. I think there are some that are also just very fun to record. Like some people's stories either that is kind of you know absurd or joyful or really uplifting um I think one episode that a lot of our listeners really connected with and tell us they go back to and listen and that we also enjoyed recording was um the life of trying to think how to pronounce her name before I say this it's a long time ago Tuva Janssen I think is how you say it the woman who um invented Moomins which are like little cartoon characters I don't know if you'd be familiar with them or not um and like she just invented these really cute little characters she used them to write children's books she used them to draw she was alive during world war ii she used them to draw anti-fascist cartoons she lived on this little island with her girlfriend they had a little cabin on this island together and like something like that where it's just such a wholesome positive uplifting story those ones are really really a joy to record Yeah, absolutely. And I can, you know, you can definitely tell why people go back and listen to them to Mm -hmm. that, you know, to hear that heartwarming and and wholesome side of things where there is a happily ever after and, you know, you're on an island drawing cartoons. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think especially because people like so often, especially if people are just coming out, they assume and hearing what's in the news and everything about like trans rights and that kind of thing. They just assume that queer experience has been so negative and will inevitably to some degree be negative. And it's really good to be able to counter that and show examples where queer people have just had good lives. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Jace, do you have any favourite episodes? I think for me, yeah, there's a a pretty clear favourite, which was the Wonder Woman episode, which was kind of the first episode I did that required a bit more kind of historical research. Um, and I kind of, you know, uh, s- stretched uh, to the limit of my historical abilities, uh, which I've kind of since gone on and done the, like, Gawain and the Green Knight episode, which was, you know, hundreds of years ago and so it required me to look at Middle Ages histor- historical texts and that kind of thing. But the one Woman episode uh, where we looked at uh, the both the lives of the creators of Wonder Woman um, and also uh, the sort of original run of Wonder Woman comics from the ni- early 1940s um, was super fun for me because it was something where I'd watched a YouTube video uh, which mentioned this when the Wonder when the first Gal Gadot Wonder Woman movie came out in what like 2014 or whatever. Yeah, a while um, ago. 
that was like, oh yeah, just casually as an aside mentioned, oh yeah, so the creator of these comics was like a polyamorous, bisexual, kinky person who like, like yeah, yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, excuse me? <laughs> right. Um, and then you see, you know, it's the same, like you see those like out of context comic panels in like Tumblr posts and stuff where it's like, oh, that's a little weird. And, you know, sometimes it's just, um, you know, old Batman comics where he's like, I need Dick. And it's because it's he, Dick Grayson is the name of Robin. <laughs> um, and that's just obviously completely out of context. But with the Wonder Woman ones, it was like, this does look quite gay. Um, there seems to be something going on here. What is what is happening? Um, and then, yeah, you go back into the lives of these creators and you can really sort of identify that. And then um, the, the other fun thing about that episode was then in the recording of the episode, uh, this is something I kind of had to sort of figure out how to present this to an audience um, was, you know, showing Alice and Eli the um, panels from the comics where I'm like, so here's an example of what they were doing in these comics. Um, and, you know, and, so, and a lot of it's based on the sort of real world experiences of these people um, and their real world kind of, you know, almost like political and sexual ideology, which was just super interesting to hear about in terms of a, you know, like a 1940s comic um, and also obviously something that's so well known today and sort of a, a very normal part of culture um, to have such a weird origin. Yeah, absolutely. And something where, you know, at the time, the queer experience of the creator was so visible, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's something where, you know, as time went on, as history went on, it became diluted, but to go back to those origins and to highlight that person's life and how there are similarities today between how a lot of people um, can openly live is important, right? And showcases like the lived experience, I think, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the like very modern Wonder Woman comics have kind of gone back and dug into that yeah. origin to then create new stories. And it's like, okay, you're doing this in a much more sort of reasonable way where you're not trying to like, get around the censorship to promote a weird message that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the, the people who are doing it whilst it's very cool it was also there was also a lot of nonsense um yeah. so it's it, but yeah it's really interesting to see after you know decades of this character kind of being you know uh her queerness being sort of shoved away or minimized to have that yeah. come back and have it feel really organic and really earned um because of the history of that character is super cool yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to kind of ask you both next, you know, because there is this, it's such a fun show, right? You've done all this research, you're diving deep, first Wikipedia, but then, you know, the real research and reading all the books. Um, but there is also like a really fun entertainment component of the show. So, you know, in terms of making sure that you have that balance, um, how do you approach the storytelling in the podcast? Good question because, well, I think firstly because we're all good friends outside of the podcast and have been friends for a decade now, um, <laughs> it comes very naturally to us to just, you know, talk very like casually. Like that's we're talking to each other the way we talk to each other outside of the podcast. So it's very easy for us to create that kind of relaxed, engaging atmosphere for our listeners. I don't think we've actively thought about how to make that engaging in, except for the fact that we've thought about knowing that we want that conversational format will make that engaging for our listeners. Um, I think you look like you want to say something, Jace. I was just going to say, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I feel like uh, I have on occasion, only very rarely, actually scripted in some jokes. <laughs> 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 the but, truth yeah, comes out. Did you just think of them in advance and then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's I'm writing the script, and you know, because I write scripts in my voice, like I, you know, I know that I'm writing this in a way that I'm going to say it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'll sort of be like, oh, I can, I know Alison, Eli, and Irene so well that I can sort of be like, I know how they're going to kind of react to this, so I can kind of put in a little tip of that. But I do think overall, we get. It's funny because we get feedback from people who are like, oh, my God, you guys are so funny or you're so engaging. Yeah. And, you know, we've always found it a little bizarre, to be honest, because, <laughs> you know, what we're primarily aiming to do is be informative. Um, the fact that the podcast is then entertaining is a massive plus and obviously, you know, means that people come back and keep listening. Um, but I don't think there's been a lot of 
like, I don't think we've really made any concessions to format aside from maybe mm. the length of the episodes. Yeah. Uh, that have been concessions to entertainment as opposed to um, being informative. That's always the primary goal. I think there are topics that I haven't touched because I know they would be very, obviously we do deal with some quite dark and difficult material, but there yeah. are definitely people I've looked up or topics I've looked up where I've just gone, this will just be miserable from start to finish. This won't be an enjoyable story. And, you know, there is some importance in telling hard queer stories, but there are also stories that I do look at. And, you know, it's people's lives which have been, you know, where there's no light, where they've like people who have been continually discriminated against and there's nothing positive for us to pull out of it. I generally don't tell those stories, but that's as much for my own sake as for the audience's mm-hmm. sake. I would look at those stories and go, I don't want to research that. I don't want to immerse myself in that for the months it's going to take me to put this together. So it's both about making it positive and engaging and enjoyable for us as it is for the audience. Yeah, I think that that's also a really important aspect. And you know, the fact that you guys are all friends, you almost feel like when you're listening, you kind of get to be f- part of the friend group. It's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what we don't call. I think it I, is. I think bit- that's, definitely, that's definitely kind of feedback that we've gotten. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys intended that from the start. I don't think we would have put it in so many words, but I think we were going for that kind of friendly yeah. atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. familial. Because you, you kind of almost feel like because it's so conversational, it's almost like you're part of of the conversation of saying of you know, hearing the story and chiming in and mm. you know, learning all the all the nuance of of you know, whatever the specific topic of of the episode is. So I think that that's a really fun aspect as well. And I also just want to know, you know, I'm wondering, Alice, if you can break down kind of the production side of what an average episode not that you guys mm-hmm. have an average episode but um <laughs> you know kind of break down like okay you know you've done the research let's say it's your episode you're you're the lead you've done the research you guys record and then after that is it the person that does the research that's going to edit um it's sometimes it's really depends honestly mostly it depends on who has the free time who's going to yeah. edit so we do definitely, you know, try to do a schedule. And for example, we said like, you know, Jace will generally edit our media episodes, but it's pretty ad hoc. I do sometimes personally step in and go, no, I want to edit the episode that I presented. And it's usually when I want to fact check myself. If I've said <laughs> something off the top of my head, where I go, oh, I think I read this in a book. Yeah, this happened. And I think I'll say it with confidence in the moment and I'll just delete it afterwards if it's not true. But yeah, the editing is definitely quite a process more of a process than we thought it would be when we started it's quite time consuming but we do generally so our episodes are say about an hour long and we would generally record for two hours so we're cutting a lot of content we're really tightening it up to make it to make it really engaging and interesting for the audience also you know to make sure all the information is correct to make sure it all stays on topic and it flows well so yeah there, it is a quite a tightly edited podcast and there's quite a lot of work involved in that side of it as well as the research and the presentation side of it yeah absolutely and you guys have a pretty dedicated audience and like you said the podcast has been going since 2017 so <laughs> it's been around for a few years um you know how how did you guys initially build your audience? Because it's something where, like you were saying, even just episode topics, you guys have a list of hundreds of topics that the audiences and listeners have sent in. So have you guys been, have you guys employed any strategy in terms of building your audience? I think we fluctuate between just doing whatever and hoping it sticks and employing strategies. Um, <laughs> <and> <laughs> a lot of that depends on the amount of time we have at our disposal because we're all working and studying, doing various things as well. So when we have more free time, we will kind of strategize and that often is strategizing around um, either our social media. So in terms of things like Pride, making sure we haven't done it this June because we're busy, but previous Junes, you know, having daily posts that are really like hyping up our episode topics and tying it into Pride and also trying to tie episodes into things that may be happening at the time, whether that's a film that's coming out or an anniversary if it's, you know, 200 years since somebody was born or uh, was 
trying to do the maths frantically in my head. It was an anniversary of Stonewall a few years ago. Yeah. Can't yeah. talk about anniversaries. <laughs> Um, so yeah, tying in with things like that, that's definitely a way in which we try to kind of reach an audience that doesn't already know about us, but maybe interested in something that's happening at the time in the kind of queer zeitgeist. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in terms of, cause the podcast has been around for quite a few years and there, podcasting, you know, when you get to that point where you've produced the show and you've, you know, been recording episodes for years upon years, you know, sometimes things pop up where you're like, oh, I didn't know that would be part of my podcasting journey. So have you guys encountered any challenges in terms of creating the podcast, maybe pod fade or burnout or, you know, it doesn't sound like there's a shortage of topics ever, but do you ever feel like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of maybe wanting to incorporate different themes I, you know i'm just wondering if there's been any any challenges or, or even just surprises in terms of the journey of making the show i think to talk about challenges and and yeah as you say we've got hundreds of suggestions but um I, an issue i often find is um particularly with the media episodes is you know and this is also true of the history suggestions as well is that the vast majority of them are, you know, white, a lot of men Mm. from Europe or North America. Um, And so, you know, it's trying to be a bit more diverse in the kind of stories that we look at, but then often, you know, especially if life gets really busy or if there's say a global pandemic and (laughs) exhausted um you know you fall back on what is easy in terms of you know what there are what you know oh cool i've already got the streaming platform that hosts this movie or like oh cool the all the biographies for this person are easily available in english and so it's very easy for us to pull together an episode in you know a month as opposed to an episode uh, on a more obscure figure from a culture that hasn't been as like well served by academia um and then it's like well suddenly that's a three or four month process where we might have mm-hmm. to wait for books to arrive and we might have to you know search them out and things like that um or you know like i mean alice you've uh gotten like help from listeners mm-hmm. with translations yeah so yeah i think that's something where there's a there's a tension um between sort of what we would want to do ideally um which you know i'd, I'd love to like have covered a movie from like you know long term like every country you know <laughs> like that, that, kind of, that kind of thing where it's like i would love to do stuff like that but it's just so much more work mm. um and um yeah that's where that's where it can be a bit challenging yeah, yeah i think that is that is our big challenge is not just balancing what we wish we could do and what we can do, but also just coming to terms with that fact. Like we so often have conversations yeah. with friends who are very well-intentioned who say, you know, oh, I've got this great idea. Why don't you do this? Why don't you reach out to these people? Why don't you do this? It'll make you reach a bigger audience. And we're sitting there going, we know. We know we could do all these things, but we just don't have the time. Yeah. Some, this is- physically we can't and that, it's very hard. It's very hard to come to terms with that fact. That is particularly true for, you know, reaching out to other creators Mm. or, you know, collaborating with different people. The amount of work it takes, as you, I'm sure, are very well aware, (laughs) the amount it takes to do a collaboration with another creator is just so infinitely more Mm. than the amount of work it takes to collaborate with Alice, who I live in the same house with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think You know, when people are listening to a podcast, it's such an enjoyable experience. You don't always know how much work goes into it, Mm -hmm. right? It's something where you don't, you know, and and a lot of podcasts that even are history-based, you know, when you're talking about the amount of research that you guys are putting in, in terms of reading books that, you know, may not be digitally available or within, you know, a mainstream narrative, it's something that takes more time. It takes more energy Mm -hmm. to create content around that, right? And, and... I think that kind of also speaks to the to the main topic as a queer history podcast, right? About how queer history was marginalized and how, you know, having diverse perspectives can be challenging because diverse perspectives, even within the queer community, especially within the queer community, have also been marginalized. 
Um, I mean, Alice, even earlier, specifically when you were talking about the history of of women's sexuality in Rome, I think, you know, it's like that was a footnote in <laughs> it took 2000 years to write yeah. that book kind of thing. So I think it is something where it, it's kind of part of the history within queer history is the marginalization of women and people of color. So it, it's definitely... Mm-hmm. It, and and the BIPOC community, so it's definitely something where it, that aspect must be, you know, kind of a built-in. Uh, I don't want to say challenge, but kind of built into the genre in a way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And the fact that you, as a team, acknowledge it and and just, I think, you know, do what you can is is important as well. So I think that that's a a really important aspect. And I want to ask next. You know, in terms of the episodes that you guys have put months into creating, because it's such a, it, it really is a labor of love. You know, it's not a podcast where you guys are doing this as your day job. You have day jobs, you're full time students, you know, and, and it's a whole team, right? What have been the episodes that have been the most rewarding, right? Where you felt like, and and I think Alice, you kind of spoke to this briefly about the about the episode about women in Rome. Um, but have there been any where you're like, I'm so glad I told this story? Hmm. Hmm. I think I'll think of a specific example as I talk, but I think the ones that are the most rewarding in that way, I would say are the ones where the stories genuinely aren't out there except that we've told them. Like we've done episodes on people who are you know, maybe their queerness isn't highly publicized, but who are very famous. Like if we did an episode on Freddie Mercury, for example, the world doesn't need us to tell them about Freddie Mercury. Everyone knows about Freddie Mercury already. It's just you know, <laughs> it's nice to have an episode on Freddie Mercury. Mm-hmm. But um, I did an episode last year, I think, for example, on a um, an American trans woman named Lucy Hicks Anderson. And I was... I got in touch with um, people in a local archive in America and I was using their newspaper scans to put together that episode. And for, so for something like that, it's really rewarding to be able to take something that's just, you know, on a piece of paper in a small town in America and bring that to an audience who would never have had access to that. They would never have been able to do that research or go to that archive or hear that story. And we've been able to let more of the world know about that person. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's such a beautiful example. And, you know, I think probably kind of one of the reasons why the podcast is so special is because, you know, it's it's opinion and it's fun, but there's also this greater purpose of mm. centering stories that haven't had the opportunity to be told or even recorded down before, right? Even written down or shared on the internet or anything like that. So there is kind of almost an honoring of of queer history and bringing it into the forefront that is kind of a mission of the podcast that that always feels really special. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think for me, I, you actually uh, made reference to it earlier, but the episode uh, we did recently on Victim, which was a 1960s British film, mm-hmm. um, really resonated with me because it's something that's really interesting to think about in terms of because our sort of cultural and historical focus and when I say our I don't mean our podcasts or although we do fall into that sometimes but just kind of general popular culture's perspective is so American centric we usually think about uh the 1960s as being a very um you know a time where queerness was not talked about in media at all um, and that's largely because of things like the Hayes Code and, you know, very American-centric laws and restrictions on media. Um, but, you know, like in the UK, they were just releasing this movie where there's just like blatantly gay men all over the movie. <laughs> um, yeah. and, you know, there's no subtext to it. It's not like having to look through and be like, oh, so this actor was gay and that's why, you know, they they have this weird little interaction and that's kind of interesting. Um, and maybe that means those two actors were sleeping together or something like that, you know, but like, no, it's just, it's just gay guys in the movie. That's the plot of the movie. That's what's going on. Um, and I think that's really important to think about. And it's something we've talked about, you know, yeah, like whenever we kind of cover a different country's cinema or like, um, popular culture or anything like that, where it's like, oh, okay, this is what was actually happening at this time. This is, this actually looks quite different to what you Um, would necessarily sort of stereotypically think about that decade or that era. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. 
I think there is a tendency, just coming off what you just said, Jace, there is a tendency for us, uh, for people in general, to assume that there's been this really linear progression in queer history from, you know, we were all very oppressed and it was horrible and nobody was allowed to talk about being gay to this better time we're in now where things are good. And it's, you know, kind of good, not that good. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's really interesting to get into those stories like Victim in the 60s, for example, where we can see that there was a chance to talk about queerness or there were other examples of cultures and societies throughout history that were being more open and more accepting and had different attitudes and see that there's that real complexity and nuance around the world of the way that queerness has been experienced. Yeah, absolutely. And and you guys are based in Australia. So for everybody out there, I don't know if we mentioned that yet. <laughs> are, you guys yeah. are you're in Melbourne, Australia. Um and for everyone in America, that's Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you really do have a global audience. So it, mm-hmm. it's a show where, you know, and, and a lot of the stories are from the US, but a lot aren't, right? And I think it's 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 interesting that you guys bring that global perspective, even though you're still in a Western country, you're able to kind of pull examples from different countries. And and even in the same time period, like you're saying, with the Hays Code and everything in the US in the 60s, how, you know, everything was so secretive, but that wasn't the global experience. Um, mm. And I think that that's, that's a really important aspect, especially, you know, in terms of representation. I think that that's huge, right? Because it's something where it's not something where there was no representation up until a certain point. It's very nuanced and it's subjective, right? To the country and the culture and the decade and, you know, a lot of other factors, right? Like gender or or race that can also, um, you know, affect how safe people were to express themselves um, and their authentic selves at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to kind of center also on the fact that you guys are in, are in Australia and, um, you know, you, the show's pretty global. You have a lot of listeners. So I, I want to talk a little bit about your listener base because it, it it seems like it's a real community that you guys have built um, in terms of the show. So Irene, can you can you share a little bit about kind of the feedback you guys have gotten from the community and, and how you guys engage with your listenership? I think engaging with our listenership is definitely one of those things that we would love to do more of if we had more time because the feedback <laughs> that we do get is so lovely and so positive especially I think my favorite kind of feedback is we get emails from people that say I've been listening to your podcast for five years I've been listening from the start and we sort of step back and say oh that's like that's so long ago that's such a journey we've been on and it's crazy to think that somebody you know somewhere on the other side of the world has actually been on that journey with us the whole time and they'll often tell us you know about how it's how listening to our podcast has been alongside them through coming out or through different relationships or different, you know, jobs or experiences they've had, how it's kind of been a constant and a comfort for them through all different things in their life. And that's just such an amazing thing to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Chase? I think, um, yeah, like also, you know, things like we we have a PO box and people send us physical letters um, mm. and, you know, we've sent back letters to people. <laughs> we have one um, listener in Canada that we just exchange recipes with. They send us Canadian recipes. We send them Australian recipes. It's got nothing to do with queer history. <laughs> <laughs> what are the recipes? Any highlights? <laughs> I always struggle to think of Australian recipes, so I don't feel like we have that many. <laughs> oh, that, banoffee pie, is that Australian? We definitely have been off here. I didn't know it was Australian. Yeah. Americans, I don't think have it. I'm not sure about oh. Canadians. So if you're, if you're okay. watching, well, live, let us know. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lamingtons, the the cake. Yeah, 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 we've done. Yeah, we've done Lamingtons. And like biscuits, mm-hmm. also very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so so then yeah, so like we've we've got a Patreon and we you know engage with people through there and then we've yeah. got like things like just our Tumblr and Twitter messages and people will message us through those and you know it's yeah it's really interesting to see the kind of array of messages that we get because you know some of them will be you know people who are very kind of online like us um and so you know the, the mess- it's a message from someone who's very similar to us and we're like oh cool we can have a little conversation and other times it's you know, someone who's really gone to an effort to find a way to reach out to us and, you know, 
it, it those are often the sweetest messages because it's like, oh, you you really aren't very online, but you've you've gone to the effort to find a way to reach out to us and you've come in and said, you know, I find this podcast really important to me and, you know, it's really important to my coming out journey or whatever it is. And um that can be that can be very sweet. Um and yeah, I just think, yeah, also yeah, the thing Al said about not only people who've been listening to us for a long time, but oh my God, the people who are like yeah, so I've listened to all your episodes like three times. <laughs> you guys have a, quite a lot of episodes. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, we've, we've just hit 150 episodes. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of content. And <laughs> I'm just always like, are you okay? And then I'm like, I mean, I, I will constantly rewatch my favorite content. Yeah, I think we all have um, those. We all have those <laughs> shows and podcasts that we re-listen to for sure. Yeah, so it's, it's funny to think of being, you know, someone's comfort show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's something where, you know, as listeners and creators, it's something where, you know, when you're listening to a podcast, if it's someone you don't know, you kind of don't necessarily think of their ent- the entirety of their lives, right? Mm-hmm. But then when you're creating the podcast, you're just like you doing your thing, right? You know? <laughs> You've got like the Fab Four kind of going on. And then it's like, I think when people find the show, there's an aspect of, and and this applies to really any podcast that as a listener, we find and, and we like, there's so much you know about that person, you know, or you feel, you know, there's, there's a, mm-hmm. a perceived emotional connection with what they've created. And and it can be really nice to hear that feedback, to know that you're on the right track or that your work is appreciated, um, and that mm-hmm. means and it means something to people. I think that that's really important, especially for for queer as fact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think you both mentioned, um, you know, in terms of feedback, people saying this was part of their coming out journey. You know, and the podcast really almost served as like a friend. It seems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do hear that from people. We also hear some some feedback we've had quite a few times in, you know, slightly different iterations is from parents who have had their kids come mm. out and either shared the podcast with their kids as a way of like supporting their kids or yeah. listen to it themselves as a way of kind of understanding the community that child is becoming a part of. Mm. And that's also, you know, it's just like we've almost we don't know these people, but we're almost kind of a part of that family's journey and they're their queer journey. And that's very nice too. Yeah. No, it definitely, You, I think you can tell from listening, it, it feels very, it feels like a community. It's a really fun show. And that mm-hmm. could just be the dynamic of your friend group <laughs> that just feels so accessible. But I think, you know, people really do feel like they're, they're, you know, a fly on the wall and a part of the, a part of the show. Um, and Jace, like you mentioned, you guys just hit 150 episodes. You're in season five of the show. Um, <laughs> I think it's like season, I mean, Is technically it I think it's like season 10. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Like we only started counting seasons like halfway through. Yeah, so I thought it was it, season five. Am I? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> It's not. Technically, there's many... yeah. Technically, what it is, is it's 150 episodes. The first, I think, around 50 episodes yeah. were not seasoned because you it was did, literally okay. just... Okay, got it. All right. We're doing an episode every two weeks. And yeah. this is something, you know, in terms of uh, advice for other podcasters. Consistency. Not schedule in breaks. Consistency, but give yourself a break. We didn't yeah. give ourselves a break for over a year, and that was madness. Yeah, it was just <laughs> that every is two madness. Weeks. Yeah. In perpetuity. And so that's where, you know, we started to have seasons when we started to be like, okay, we're going to do a- an episode every two weeks for five months and then take a month off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've just recently changed our schedule again. And so the seasons kind of like get a bit more. Okay. Re- thank you. Because re- I, I didn't get that wrong. Thank you very much. Um, um, <laughs> but it's definitely something where I think, uh, you know, and we talk about this just briefly. I'll, I'll touch on this, you know, with all the podcasters at Podbean it seems to be a real juxtaposition of both, right? You want your audience to know when your show's coming out, what day of the week, what time, um, and and to have that consistency. And as a podcaster, you are a human being. (laughs) (laughs) You, you know, you you need to take breaks and Mm -hmm. whatever works for you is also going to be part of the formula that works for your show that your audience resonates with. So it's important to, to give yourself that grace as well. Um, yeah, I, I think we often find at this point really that like often we put out new episodes and obviously they, you know, do better than, you know, 
the older episodes because they're new and out. Like we've got a core listener base that will listen to every new episode that gets put out. But also um, what we often find is anytime we get new listeners, it's we're so grateful. We, have, we can literally notice when like a tweet gets like retweeted and 10 people like it. Because even if like five of those people go and listen to every episode in our archive, there's like 750 downloads, right? <laughs> like it's like a noticeable bump because of like five people from someone's friends list uh, finding the podcast. And that's just so wild to think about now. I think that's, you know, kind of the advantage of having been doing this for so long. And also just, you know, because our episodes are on historical figures or on films and TV shows and books or whatever, where people might organically find them um and you know they might be researching this person's oh there's a podcast episode on that um and that's that's a really um (laughs) you know really rewarding to see it's like oh okay people are still seeking information out on this person still finding our uh content and you know constantly being like oh I i just found you through this episode that's a really common thing we see with our like reviews and feedback is I found you through your episode on yeah. Freddie Mercury led the way, <laughs> right? I think that, that that's so important, right? Your content's evergreen. So if there's a mm-hmm. if there's an episode that somebody finds years from now, right? They'll be able to find the whole catalog and those episodes are all still relevant. They're from history. You guys have done the research and I think we've all found podcasts that way, right? You just, a random episode will just guide you into like a cache, right? like, a, <laughs> like a pirate, you know, treasure cache of just, yeah. oh, I yeah. found this podcast. It's like, you know, when you discover a, a series and it's like bingeable, you know, it's, it's, it's so <laughs> exciting because not only are you enjoying the moment, but you're enjoying the future moments at the same time. <laughs> It's funny because there's also a bit of a flip side to that. If somebody, you know, sends us a review or a message or whatever and says, oh, I found your podcast through such and such an episode and that episode is from 2017, part of me is like, oh, no, don't listen to that. That was so long ago. We didn't know how to do anything. It'll sound bad. The research will be worse. We'll be more <laughs> awkward like on it. <laughs> if you ask, and we talk about this all the time at Podbean. If you ask any podcaster to go back and listen to their first episode, they will be like, you oh, no. cannot pay me enough money. You can't. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely it it's it's a common thing. Yeah. Yeah. The very some of the very few negative comments that we've gotten, um, you know, it'll be like, oh, the audio is just awful. <laughs> and we're like, we don't disagree. Right. The audio was bad. <laughs> well, like, Listen to our latest episode. How do you like us now? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, when and- we didn't have uh, a mic each. It was one mic that we were sharing, and also we were recording under a kitchen table with a blanket down the sides. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think also what's great, uh, you know, being so far into the show is that your audience has grown with the show, like you mm-hmm. mentioned. So it's something where uh, you know, and and a lot of podcasts have expressed this. You know that the the listener is along for the ride, right? They're kind of there with you under the kitchen table at the very beginning. Um, and they're still with you now. And I think for everybody out there who finds the earlier episodes, that content really stands for itself. So even though it's not something that you as creators want to listen to, it definitely still has a lot of value. Um, That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure, you know, hearing about the show and, and what goes into it and the community that you guys have built. Um, looking ahead, um, is there anything that listeners and the audience here can can look forward to in terms of what's coming up for Queer as Fact and Queer as Fiction? Well, I guess our next two episodes, yours, uh, you were involved episode. in an episode that's coming out next and then oh, yeah. it'll be uh, my episode <laughs> after that. So do you want to talk about yours first? Yeah, so our next episode, I'd just forgotten about it because we recorded it. It's done in my mind, but it's not out yet. Um, we've just done an interview with Danielle Scrimshaw, who is an Australian queer historian, and she's just written a book on the history of queer women in Australia. And similarly to the history of queer women in ancient Rome, it's never been done. There's never been a book about queer women's history in Australia until this year. So that was really exciting to get to talk to her and look at this topic that's been really neglected. And it's her books are split up chapter by chapter, going through and telling the story of different queer women throughout Australian history. So that's our episode that's coming out in a couple of days is an interview with her looking at that. So Actually, by the time, what day is it today? It'll be out, I think, by the time it's this out. Is out. It's out. <laughs> yeah, you can Go listen now. It. Yeah, right now. It's already out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then uh, July 1st, uh, we'll have out um, 
my episode, uh, which is going to be on uh, a league of their own, um, the uh, queer baseball show. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but also looking at the historical context of women's baseball uh, in the US and yeah. uh, sort of the queer story, the real life queer stories that the show was then based upon. Yeah. Um, is it so, on? The, is it on the the new Amazon series? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So new Amazon series. We are gonna mm. we are gonna briefly talk about the movie, although um, yeah, the movie's not very queer, so <laughs> there's not gonna be as much to talk about there. Um, but uh, yeah, we gonna, I've definitely looking as a preview, been looking a lot into the the history um, and being like, oh, okay, this is a lot more both easily accessible. I think partly because a lot of people did the research for articles when the show came out. Yeah. Um, but also because, you know, this isn't super old history, you know, like especially because when you're talking about sports people um, in the, you know, 50, uh, in, sorry, in the, in the like 40s, 40s. and 50s, yeah. um, it's, you know, they were probably 20 to 30 for the most part. And it's like, well, so a lot of them were alive well into the 2000s. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we often have things like obituaries and, you know, things like that that will t- talk about their lives and talk about their partners and their relationships um, and interviews that have been done uh, because, you know, they kind of survived long enough for queer rights activists and historians and journalists to sort of go digging and find information about these people. So that's been really, really fun and I'm really looking forward to that episode. Yeah, absolutely. And and for their stories to be told, you know, it's they lived through the the change in our culture so yeah yeah um unfortunately yeah it's another american episode but <laughs> i just i loved the show so much we have we have a friend of ours um gab who is a uh queer woman who plays sport and so she was immediately obsessed with the show <laughs> and, um uh we were like well we have to watch it then and we we all really really enjoyed it so um yeah i'm looking forward to getting a season two even if it's going to be shorter than what we were hoping um but yeah hopefully for anyone who hasn't given it a look yet um hopefully our episode will give a few people a nudge to go (laughs) and check it out yeah absolutely well that'll be out you said july 1st so just coming right up and um yeah so much to look forward to uh I think, you know, it's just such a great show and we're really excited to chat with you guys today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to read our brief outro. Any last words? Uh, No, I guess just thank you so much for having us on. Um, It's been been a real pleasure. And um, yeah, we hope uh, anyone who's, you know, listening, who's making their own podcast that found uh, what we were talking about helpful. And for anyone uh, who was just interested to hear from us, uh, we hope you learned some uh, new stories and interesting things about sort of the creation of our podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. And thank you everyone for joining us for this live stream of Podbean Storytelling Podcast Week and Podcasting Smarter Live Series. For our live event for June, Pride Through History, a live conversation with the creators of the Queer as Fact podcast featuring Alice and Jace of the Queer as Fact podcast. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Storytelling Podcast Week has live stream sessions like this one with top podcasters and storytellers from scripted fiction and nonfiction podcasts from across our world and our imaginations. If you join late or want to have another listen to this amazing conversation, you can replay this live stream on Podbean's YouTube channel and on our Podcasting Smarter podcast. We're brought to you by Podbean. We're a podcast hosting and monetizing platform and home to over 640,000 podcasts. To start your podcast, head over to podbean.com today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Alice and Jace. And stay tuned for our next live event in August. June, July. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this replay of our live event episode. If you have any questions about podcasting and want to get in touch with the Podbean team, reach out to us at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Happy podcasting.